Organisms that are closely related to each other share many similarities in genetics and morphology. I already made a video discussing the genetic similarities among different organisms and why that's good evidence for evolution. Thus, today we're going to look at the morphological similarities among organisms, so let's jump right in. Homology is the state of having shared ancestry between two structures or genes in different taxa of organisms. In my video Genetics, we looked at the genetic similarities among different organisms, demonstrating that genetics are a fantastic piece of evidence for common ancestry. No doubt Darwin would have been astounded by how much credence genes lend to his theory. However, in his day, Darwin could only observe the morphology of different organisms and draw conclusions from that. Regardless, even in the 1800s, the evidence for common ancestry among different organisms from morphology was strong. It makes sense in evolution that closely related organisms should have structures derived from the same genes, since evolution proceeds by successive genetic modifications through generations. Evolution recognizes that organisms adapt to environments and their genomes undergo changes through mutations. Thus, the structure or gene in question is changed as time goes on. In fact, this concept can be tested, and surely enough, it has been. I document a number of papers in my video, Common Ancestry, that test predictions put forth by Common Ancestry, which show that Common Ancestry is the most parsimonious conclusion for biodiversity. For instance, the 2013 paper, Beyond Reasonable Doubt, Evolution from DNA Sequences, tests nucleotide sequences in different clades of organisms, saying this. Quote, it is a fundamental prediction from evolutionary theory that convergence should continue at deeper times, and this is strongly supported as shown by the first four rows of results in Table 2, which use chloroplast genomes from deeper and deeper divergence times. This eliminates one simple model that allowed creation of archetypes and limited evolution thereafter. Similarly, we find ancestral convergence with nuclear encoded sequences from vertebrates and invertebrates and also with mitochondrial genomes from birds. Thus, we have used chloroplast, nuclear, and mitochondrial DNA sequences and from a wide variety of species. Close quote. So, genetics provides great support for evolution. However, we're here today to discuss morphology. Clearly, many organisms share similar features. Tetrapods, for example, are all defined by having four limbs or being descended from an ancestor that did, such that snakes, whales, the moa, and glass lizards are all still tetrapods. We see in the genetics of each that the genes for limbs still exist. The same applies to the genes for teeth in toothless mammals like aardvarks, pangolins, armadillos, sloths, anteaters, and baleen whales. And when you look at the limbs of tetrapods, you see that they all have the same basic limb plan. They all have one humerus, a radius and ulna, wrist, hand, and finger bones. So if you have these bones in your arm or are descended from someone who did, then you're a tetrapod. Just like all other mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and a few extinct fish. How weird is that? But you also have hair or fur, lactal mammaries, and three bones in your middle ear, making you a mammal. Do you have the characteristics of a primate? Well, let's find out. For example, primates are collectively defined as any gillless organic RNA DNA protein based metabolic metazoic nucleic diploid bilaterally symmetrical endothermic digestive triploblast episcotont deuterostome colomate with a spinal cord and 12 cranial nerves connecting to a limbic system in an enlarged cerebral cortex with a reduced olfactory region inside a jawed skull with specialized teeth including canines and premolars, forward oriented, fully enclosed optical orbits, and a single temporal fenestra attached to a vertebrate hind leg dominant tetrapoidal skeleton with a sacral pelvis, clavicle, and wrist and ankle bones and having lungs, tear ducts, body-wide hair follicles, lactal memories, opposable thumbs, and keratinized dermis and chitinous nails on all five digits and all four extremities. In addition to an embryonic development, an amniotic fluid leading to a placental birth and a highly social lifestyle. Thanks, Aaron. Sounds like you do. Do you develop in an amniotic sac? Then you're an amniote. Do you have a backbone? Then you're a vertebrate. Did you have, at some point in your development, a post-anal tail, 
notochord, dorsal hollow nerve cord, and pharyngeal slits, then you're a chordate. Do you have bilateral symmetry? Then you're a bilaterian. Do you have three germ layers? Then you're a triploblast. Do you have multiple cells and an internal digestive tract? Then you're an animal. Do your sex cells have flagella that push from behind, or are you descended from an organism that did? Then you're an opisthocont. Do your cells have a nucleus? Then you're a eukaryote. Do you maintain homeostasis, are composed of cells, undergo metabolism, can grow, adapt to your environment, respond to stimuli, and reproduce? Then you're living. C. Even when we don't use genetics, morphology builds clades. Then we can use genetics to either confirm or refute those clades formed by morphology. In the large majority of cases, at least for animals, genetics confirms what morphology says. But why? Why should morphology be related to genetics? Presumably, if an all-powerful deity created all life on Earth, then that deity shouldn't be constrained to corresponding morphology with genetics. There's no reason why a deity should have to give all tetrapods the same genes for making limbs. The assertion that that's just what God saw as good design is ad hoc and doesn't produce any verifiable observations, experiments, or predictions. Rather, homologies are produced because organisms are descended from ancestors that had genes coding for those structures. As genes are passed along through the generations and mutations accrue, structures are gradually changed. Thus, common ancestry does, unlike creationism, provide verifiable observations, experiments, and predictions. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.